The plot twist at the end of this story will make you wonder if you could ever trust anyone completely. If you are a true crime enthusiast, welcome aboard. We regularly post new content three times a week. If you haven't already subscribed, please like this video as it greatly supports this channel. Also subscribe with notifications turned on so you will be notified of all our future posts. Michael DiPolito had his early years marred by a challenging upbringing in the tough neighborhoods of South Philadelphia. Violence, drugs and prostitution were grimly routine aspects of daily life. Following in his parents' footsteps, Michael descended into alcoholism from a young age. His life took an even darker turn as he developed a severe drug addiction, resorting to drug dealing to sustain it. Michael's educational journey came to an abrupt halt as he dropped out of high school. Soon after, he found himself homeless, surviving by seeking refuge in abandoned buildings, enduring freezing nights on the streets. In 1993, while still in South Philadelphia, Michael encountered his first brush with the law. He faced charges related to possession and intent to distribute an unspecified drug. As court records remained silent on the specifics of the drug, Michael chose not to appear in court, resulting in a warrant for his arrest. Remarkably, Michael managed to elude capture by the police. By 1997, he had fled South Philly entirely and landed in South Florida, specifically in Boca Raton. Shortly after arriving, Michael faced his second arrest. This time, he propositioned an undercover police officer, offering $15 in exchange for sex. Michael admitted guilt to soliciting prostitution, but was swiftly released. In an unexpected twist, Michael crossed paths with associates of the Bonanno family while on his quest for greater financial stability. The Bonanno family was one of the notorious five families deeply embedded in organized crime across the United States, and they were none other than the Italian Mafia itself. Following his introduction to the Mafia, they developed a liking for Michael, offering him a more lucrative, albeit illicit, opportunity. They assigned him a role within one of their notorious boiler rooms. Now, a boiler room in this context isn't a literal boiler room, but rather a group of fraudsters who employ high-pressure sales tactics to swindle unsuspecting victims. Typically, a fraudster initiates a cold call, pitching an enticing get-rich-quick scheme and insisting on immediate monetary commitment. When the victim, eager to join the scheme, wires the money, the fraudster simply absconds with the funds. Michael, charismatic and a born salesman, became adept at deceiving people into parting with their money. Gradually, he recognized that he could amass significantly more wealth if he established his own boiler room, where he could enjoy higher commissions from the money he pilfered. Without much ado, he left the Mafia's boiler room. Their reaction to his departure remains unclear. Michael proceeded to set up not one, but two boiler room scams in South Florida. By 2002, he had managed to pocket $155,000 from ill-gotten gains. However, he squandered nearly all of it on lavish hotels, cars, and phone services. Yet, Michael's fortune took a sharp downturn in 2002 when law enforcement caught wind of his boiler room operations, launching raids that led to Michael's third arrest. This time, he faced court proceedings, stood trial, and received a sentence of two years in prison, accompanied by 28 years of probation and an order to repay the $155,000 he had stolen. Michael served only seven months of his two-year prison sentence, but it left an indelible mark on him. Prison was an unbearable experience for him, and every moment felt excruciating. During those endless, sleepless nights in his cell, he made a solemn vow to himself never to return to his old ways. Upon his release in 2003, Michael promptly enrolled in a sobriety program. He began his mornings at the gym and embarked on a journey to earn his GED, as he had never attained his high school diploma. A few months later, after successfully obtaining his GED, he ventured into the business world. He founded a legal enterprise, Mad Money Inc., a digital marketing firm. Over the ensuing years, Michael made earnest efforts to lead an upright life, steering clear of trouble for the most part. By 2008, he remained sober, despite occasional setbacks, 
and maintained a strong focus on his physical fitness and overall health. His business, Mad Money, thrived, yielding an annual income of nearly $100,000. However, his romantic life took a turbulent turn. In 2007, Michael tied the knot with his longtime girlfriend, Maria Luongo, who had steadfastly stood by him during his incarceration. Yet, in 2008, at the age of 38, he engaged in an affair with a 26-year-old real estate agent named Dahlia Muhammad, whom he had met at a social event. This liaison would set the stage for a series of events that would turn Michael's life upside down. Rather than their affair being a fleeting encounter, as both likely anticipated, Michael and Dahlia swiftly found themselves deeply in love. In light of this, Michael approached his wife Maria with the truth, resulting in their divorce. A mere three days after the divorce was finalized, Michael and Dahlia made their way to the courthouse and exchanged vows. The newlyweds settled into a brand new condo that Michael had acquired for them in the picturesque town of Boynton Beach, nestled in South Florida. Their life together was initially idyllic. They were well aware that the whirlwind nature of their connection and rapid marriage might seem unconventional to others, but they paid little heed. They shared a strong bond and were eager about what the future held. However, this picture-perfect life would prove to be short-lived. On the evening of March 12, 2009, just a month after their marriage, Michael and Dahlia were at home in their condo when an unexpected knock echoed at the front door. Michael answered, only to be met with astonishment. Standing on the other side was his probation officer, accompanied by a cadre of police officers. Before Michael could inquire about the situation, the probation officer informed him that they had received an anonymous tip alleging that Michael was involved in selling steroids, ecstasy pills, and other narcotics from his condo. Michael vehemently denied the allegations, emphasizing that he was sober and not involved in such activities. Eventually, he stepped aside, permitting the officers to search his condo, declaring, please come in, I have nothing to hide. As the police combed through his condo, they found no evidence to substantiate the accusations and ultimately departed. Left in the wake of the police search, Michael and Dahlia found themselves in their condo, utterly bewildered. Rather than delving into the mystery behind the anonymous calls and their motives, they decided it would be best to vacate their condo for the night, opting to stay at a luxurious hotel. They hastily packed their belongings. Leaving their condo now in disarray due to the police search, they checked into the hotel for a peaceful evening together. The following morning, when they ventured down to the parking lot, they were met with a sight that left them both perplexed. Michael's probation officer and several other police officers were gathered near Michael's car. Michael and Dahlia exchanged puzzled glances, wondering what was unfolding. They hurried over to the vehicle, but before they could defend their innocence to Michael's probation officer, he interrupted and said, We've received another anonymous tip, this time alleging that you are involved in drug trafficking from your vehicle. Consequently, we need to conduct a search. Michael was flabbergasted but relented, stating, Go ahead, search it. There's nothing in the car. True to his words, the police meticulously scoured Michael's car, yet once again their efforts yielded no incriminating evidence. Over the subsequent couple of weeks, Michael and Dahlia pondered the perplexing situation. They were left grappling with questions about the identity of the anonymous tipster and their motives for falsely accusing Michael of drug-related activities. Fast forward to March 29th, a mere 17 days after the initial raid on their condo. That night, Michael and Dahlia had enjoyed a meal at a restaurant. As they exited and headed to the parking lot, a familiar sight awaited them. Several police officers clearly anticipating their return. Without the need for questions, Michael and Dahlia approached the officers, pleading for understanding, desperately trying to convey that they were being set up. There are no drugs in this car. We have no idea what's happening here. Please, you have to realize that someone is targeting us. This time, however, the search of Michael's car would yield something quite different. Among the items found during the search was a small bag of cocaine concealed within a cigarette carton, discreetly tucked beneath the spare tire in the trunk. When Michael saw the officers retrieve the cocaine, despair washed over him. He knew that even though it wasn't his and he hadn't placed it there, he was facing an impending arrest for possession. With his probation status, 
his future looked bleak. Tears welled up as he pleaded with the police, swearing that the cocaine didn't belong to him. Meanwhile, Dahlia was equally perplexed. She began to doubt her husband. Could Michael be hiding the truth? Had he been involved in drug-related activities all along? And had he been lying to her? However, as she witnessed her husband's hysterical crying and the sincerity in his eyes, she couldn't help but believe that he was telling the truth. She soon stood by his side, joining in his pleas with the police, insisting that this was an elaborate setup. Remarkably, these officers, cognizant of the previous raids on Michael and Dahlia's property, expressed their suspicion. They acknowledged the mounting strangeness of the situation, a recurring series of calls alleging drug sales, coupled with the sudden appearance of drugs in Michael's car. Their response surprised the couple as they said, look, we find this whole situation highly suspicious. Someone keeps making these calls about you selling drugs, and now, inexplicably, the drugs appear in your car. We won't arrest you. We won't arrest you. Instead, go home, stay safe, report any unusual activity, and we'll launch an investigation to identify the caller. Michael and Dahlia were overwhelmed with relief, but couldn't shake the fear that someone was determined to bring trouble to their doorstep, ready to break into their property and plant drugs inside their condo as well. So they hurried back to their condo after the officers left. They meticulously searched every nook and cranny, seeking any signs of recent intrusion or illicit substances. Finding nothing amiss, they locked the doors, closed the windows, drew the blinds, and prayed fervently that the police would swiftly identify the perpetrator and put an end to their torment. Over the following months, the police made no headway in identifying the anonymous caller, as the calls abruptly ceased. For a brief period, Michael and Dahlia convinced themselves that the ordeal had concluded and they attempted to resume their normal lives. However, on August 5, 2009, approximately four months after the cocaine incident, the anonymous caller resurfaced with a vengeance. That morning at around 5.45 a.m., Dahlia left their condo, leaving Michael still in bed. She headed to the local gym for her usual workout routine. Around 6.30 a.m., as she stepped off the treadmill, she glanced at her phone, noticing a missed call from an unfamiliar number. This unknown number had also left her a voicemail. Her heart raced as she called her voicemail and brought it to her ear. The message sent shivers down her spine. It was a Boynton Beach detective urgently informing her of an incident at their condo, instructing her to return immediately. Terrified and without hesitation, Dahlia collected her belongings and dashed out of the gym. She jumped into her car, dialed the number back, and attempted to glean more details from the detective about the situation, desperate for answers. The detective, however, provided only cryptic information, assuring her it involved her husband and promising to explain everything upon her return. In a state of shock, Dahlia sped out of the parking lot, racing back toward their condo. As she turned onto her street and saw their residence, she abruptly slammed the brakes. A spectacle of police vehicles with flashing lights and officers milling around confronted her. Yellow crime scene tape encircled the exterior of their property, and within that cordoned-off zone, crime scene photographers meticulously documented the scene. Dahlia remained in her car at the top of the street, paralyzed by the surreal sight. She noticed a Boynton Beach police officer observing her and approached her vehicle. After confirming her identity as Dahlia DiPolito, he instructed her, Leave your car here and come with me. Dahlia, cognizant that something grave had transpired but unaware of the extent, shifted her car into park, exited, and followed the police officer toward a group of three individuals positioned in front of her property. Among them was the detective who had delivered the fateful phone call. Dahlia was led closer to the trio, and the detective, in a matter-of-fact tone, informed her that someone had reported a disturbance at their condo, resulting in gunfire. Tragically, her husband Michael had lost his life. Overwhelmed with grief and hysteria, Dahlia was gently guided away from the condo and ushered into a nearby police car. They transported her to the police station, where she was seated and subjected to a series of questions about her husband. The officers conveyed the urgency of the situation, explaining that they needed to piece together the events to apprehend the perpetrator, who was now at large. 
Initially, the conversation between Dahlia and the detective was marked by her tears, with the detective doing his best to console her. As time passed, Dahlia shared her account of the anonymous caller who repeatedly alerted the police to Michael's alleged drug dealing. She also mentioned how she and Michael had their suspicions that this anonymous caller might be linked to someone from his turbulent past, a connection to the mafia, or perhaps one of the aggrieved victims of his boiler room scams. It could have been any number of individuals who Michael had wronged in the past. The detective diligently took notes, attentively listening to Dahlia's words. Then, during a pause in the conversation, he abruptly changed the tone, saying to Dahlia, Now you know that I've advised you of your rights, right? Yes, you have. Okay. The game's over with. Okay? There's no more games with you and I. Now we're going to get down to serious business. I want to know if you know this guy. Come here. Bring this guy in here. Get over here. Get over here. You know who this guy is? No. You've never seen him before? I've never seen him before. Ever. Do you know her? Put your head up and look at her. Put your head up. I've never seen him. What were you doing coming out of her house? Get him out of here. However, it would later be revealed that Dahlia had lied. She did know who that man was. Shortly after marrying Michael six months earlier, she had embezzled $200,000 from him. But evidently her greed knew no bounds. She coveted the remainder of Michael's wealth as well as his condo. Thus, she had acted as the anonymous caller, notifying the police of Michael's supposed drug dealing at the condo and in his car. She was the one who had planted the cocaine in the back of his vehicle, hoping to have him arrested given his probationary status, which would have led to an extended jail term. However, when her scheme failed and Michael remained unarrested and out of jail, Dahlia shifted to plan B. She reached out to one of her former boyfriends inquiring, do you happen to know any hitmen who could eliminate my husband? Initially, the ex-boyfriend didn't take her seriously. Yet as she persisted and began offering payment, making her lethal intent unmistakable, he decided to report her to the Boynton Beach Police Department. He informed them about Dahlia's plan to hire a hitman to assassinate Michael. Upon learning of this sinister plot, the Boynton Beach Police Department promptly arranged for one of their undercover agents to pose as a hitman and scheduled a meeting with Dahlia. The undercover agent, the imposing man in handcuffs, had been led into the room with Dahlia. Dahlia met with the undercover agent, believing him to be the hitman she sought. Inside the car, an inconspicuous camera in the back seat recorded their conversation. On camera, Dahlia explicitly expressed her intent to have her husband killed. She handed over money to the undercover agent, and as she was about to leave, he turned to her, issuing a chilling warning. Are you absolutely sure about this? Once you're gone, it's done. I'll take care of Michael and there's no turning back. So on the fateful morning of August 5th, Dahlia left her condo at 5.45 a.m. and made her way to the gym, firmly believing that the hired hitman would arrive at her condo shortly afterward, breaking in and carrying out the planned execution. Two shots to the head, all of which had been meticulously captured on film. After monitoring her departure from the condo, the police sprang into action. 
They knocked on the door and Michael, completely bewildered, answered. Unaware that his wife was plotting his murder, he followed their lead and was escorted to the police station. Over the next hour, the police painstakingly fabricated a convincing mock crime scene right outside the condo. Once everything was in place, the detective left Dahlia a voicemail, informing her of the incident and instructing her to return to the condo. Minutes later, when Dahlia called back agreeing to return, the TV crew from the cops show concealed themselves in the bushes, prepared to document Mr. the Boyle, unfolding events. I'm Sergeant Ramsey. I'm, I'm the one who called you. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry to call you. Listen, we had a report of a disturbance at your house, and there were shots fired. Is your husband Michael? Okay, I'm sorry to tell you, man. He's been killed. He's, he's been killed, man. <laughs> Following the removal of the fake hitman from the interrogation room, and after Dahlia feigned ignorance by saying, I don't know who he is. The detective fixed a penetrating gaze on her, engulfing the room in silence for a full minute. Then, he shattered the facade, revealing his knowledge of her murder plot, and delivered the arresting words, You're under arrest. He's an undercover police officer. Everything has been recorded. You were photographed in the convertible when you sat in his car in front of CVS. What do you want to do? What's your next move here? You're going to jail today for solicitation of murder. You're under arrest. That's an undercover police officer. We filmed everything that you did, recorded everything that you did. You're going to jail for solicitation of first degree murder of your husband. Did you hear what I just told you? I heard what you said, but I didn't Everything, know what I listen to me. Everything has been recorded. You were photographed in the convertible when you sat in his car in the front of CVS. What do you want to do? What do you want to do here? I didn't Dahlia? do anything. Listen to me. I didn't do anything. You're going to I jail. I didn't do anything. Please, I didn't do anything. After Dahlia's arrest, she remained seated in the interrogation room. The Boynton Beach Police Department took deliberate steps to escort Dahlia's husband, Michael, past the open door, ensuring she caught a glimpse of him. Her reaction was undeniable. He's alive. Come here, please. Come here. Mike, come here. Come here, please. Come here. Yeah, can't fix this. Why not? I didn't do anything I to you. I heard you. Mike, come here, please. Come here. Okay. Mike, we'll take it back. Michael and Dahlia were granted a divorce in 2011, two years after she was arrested for trying to have him murdered in their Boynton Beach home. Palm Beach County Judge Glenn Kelly denied Dahlia DiPolito's request to go free on house arrest while she appealed her June conviction of solicitation of first-degree murder. The 34-year-old woman was found guilty in her third trial to have her newlywed husband killed by a hitman in 2009. She was sentenced to 16 years in prison in July 2017. Hey friends, if you found today's stories interesting, please subscribe to our channel and enable notifications, ensuring you never miss our weekly uploads. Your support is invaluable as we bring you new stories every week. Until next time.